We started this series a few weeks ago on the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we went through the Beatitudes and blessing, what, what that meant for Jesus, and what Jesus was trying to teach us about uh, blessings. Who really is blessed? It's not the rich. Um, it's the people who are poor in spirit, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and those who mourn, and those, those kinds of things. And you can look at that, um, Matthew chapter 5, like 1 through 13, or somewhere in there. And then last week we talked about how Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He didn't come to abolish it. Um, uh, we said this, the, the law was designed to, the, the Jewish law originally was designed to give them a common identity, um, give them a moral compass, and then point the way to true life. That, those were the, the three things that, that uh, they, they meant for that law to do. And then Jesus fulfilled those things. Jesus brought all of those together so that we have a common identity. And through Jesus, we have a, a moral compass. And he obviously points the way to true life. Um, he's the, 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 way, the, um, the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. And then, then the, the next part of the sermon, I'm just going to lump it all together. Um, so if you're in, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, we're starting in uh, verse 21. We're going to go to the end of the chapter. We're going to lump it all together because there's a key phrase, that, a turn of phrase that he uses um, in all of the points that he makes there. So I just want to use that as our, our jumping off point. Now, Jesus then details laws that, that the Jewish people knew by heart. All right, he says, I've come to fulfill the law. And now he's like giving these examples of the law that he came. They knew them by heart. They'd followed them for like 1,500 years or so, for a long time. They'd been part of, of, of who they were. They grew up knowing these things. And, and again, they, they were there so that they would be a unique and different people, set apart and holy, identified as Yahweh's people. The problem is that even though they followed them by heart, and they knew them by their memory, they didn't have their heart in it. All right, Their heart wasn't in it. Uh, I, we, we, the previous series before this, we called it Unmasking Our Faith. You know, we talked about that. And I talked about how uh, uh, right now we've got a state mandate that says uh, we've got to wear masks in public indoors uh -oh, and uh, outdoors when we can't socially distance, right? Now, I, I'm, a, I'm a dutiful citizen. I, I wear the mask when I go out, um, but my heart isn't in it. <laughs> like, Governor, you can't make me like it. Um, I'll do it, but you can't make me like it. I'm not going to... Uh, so we kind of relax the requirement in here. Like you guys know the, the routine now. You come in wearing a mask, but then when you sit down uh, at your spaces, you can take those off, and that's all fine. We can follow the law, but not the heart of the law, right? Um, how many of you follow the law of speed limits? Eh... So we have uh, one, our eldest daughter, Abby, she's learning how to drive, right? And so we're taking her out on, on the, the, the roads and everything, and, and, and we're telling her to observe the speed limits. And we live out by Horns Hill Road, and for her, 35 miles per hour on Horns Hill Road seems really, really slow. Do you know why it seems really, really slow to her? It's because she's hardly ever ridden in the car at 35 miles per hour on Horns Hill Road. We tend to go a little too fast on there. You follow the speed limit, but sometimes your heart's not in it. Jesus is saying to us, my people will be identified not just by their obedience to the letter of the law, but by actually going further than the law requires and our hearts being fully invested in it. He lays out these new kingdom politics, these ways of interacting with other worlds, or the, the rest of the world, and it's not like a new list of rules to follow, rather it's further examples of old rules now followed by the heart, fulfilled in a different way. And the example that, examples that he provides are, are really social principles that guide us in interacting with one another, guide us from a moral compass point of view, and give us a common identity as to how Jesus' followers should be seen and should be known by the world. So there's two purposes here, common identity, moral compass. You put them together, and they point the way to true life. So in effect, 
when you put the sermon all together, Jesus is saying, I have come to fulfill the law. For example, here's some of those laws that you know by heart. Now let's follow them through the heart. You're going to see a familiar pattern develop here as I read the, the sermon. You've, he, he says this phrase over and over. Uh, you've heard it said, but I say to you. So I, this is long. Okay, I'm going to read a ton of scripture here. It's long. So in order to keep our, our, our focus like in it, and so you're listening, every time uh, there's a you have heard it said, I want you guys to shout it out. And, and if you're at home, or, or you can put it in the, the chats, you have heard it said, just say, you have heard it said, and then I'll keep on, and then you can re- also respond with, but I say to you, all right? So we're going we're gonna to just try it. It starts right at the beginning. Can you say it together? You heard it said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Here we go. But I say to you, good, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, there's a, the Greek word he uses there, raka, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering a gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you'll never get out of jail until you've paid the last penny. Here's another one. Ready? Ready? You heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Here we go. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, Cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body to go to hell. It was also said, this is another way of saying what? You heard it said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Here we go. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, You have heard it said, come on, we're losing it. Here we go, try it again. You have heard it said, uh, well, I lost my place. You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head. For you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes and no. And anything more than this comes from evil. We got two more. Ready? You heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But I say to you, oh yeah, here we go, you can do it with me. (laughs) But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anybody slaps you in the right cheek, turn turn to him the other one also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And here's the last one. What? You heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. That's a lot of scripture, isn't it? And actually, uh, originally, that's how, how the Bible was meant to be delivered, just orally, orally and orally. <laughs> like, you're supposed to just hear it. 
we do a lot of reading and studying and preaching, but, but um, I think there's actually a new wave of like small groups that are starting where all you do is come together and just read significant portions of Scripture. I, I think that would sound kind of fantastic, but other people would be like, that's really boring, you know? But, but why? Why is it boring when we read significant chunks of Scripture out loud? It shouldn't be. We, we need to, to do that. Now, uh, this morning, those last two um, that, that we just read, you know, about um, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and love your neighbor, hate your enemy, I'm pushing those to next week. We're going to talk about those next week. So these other three are, are where we're focusing, focusing today. One fulfills the law by living out the heart principle behind the law. That's the nutshell version of what Jesus is trying to get at here. One fulfills the law by living out the heart principle behind the law. Jesus is saying to us, it's not good enough to just not murder people. Right? Isn't that, I mean, isn't that kind of like, but I'm good, I haven't murdered anybody. Like, that's not quite good enough. That's probably the, the case for most of us, yeah? Like, I don't know. Let's be honest, we've had some rough dudes coming in and out of here, so I can't speak for everybody, but for the most part, I don't think we've murdered anybody. That's right. Okay, nobody's raising their hand. Okay, we haven't murdered anybody. In the first century Jewish culture, that would check the box. We're good. We're righteous. I didn't murder anybody. But God meant so much more for humanity than simply not murdering each other. Remember, the original laws were meant to set them apart from their neighbor and encourage growth of the nation. You can't grow as a nation if you're murdering each other. But Jesus gets to the heart of the issue, and that's anger. You, yeah, yeah, murder will be, bring judgment, but anger can bring judgment as well, according to Jesus. Guess what else? He says anger impacts your worship. In Jesus' politics, reconciliation with fellow human beings is more important than worship. And, it, and it's, it's if you remember that someone else has something against you, not the other way around. Normally we go, I have something against somebody else. But it's, he's saying the responsibility is on you if they have something against you. I, I've said it before, like, in my arrogance, well, yeah, if he has a problem with me, he can come talk to me about it, right? Come, just, I'm an open guy. Come talk to me if you've got an issue with me. And Jesus is more like, no, 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 no. If you know he has an issue with you, then you need to go to him and reconcile that issue and do it before you come to worship because that's more important to have that reconciliation than it is for you to come to worship. He also talks about settling matters out of court. He says you might get thrown in prison. I think, I think we can kind of turn it a little bit and say, if you don't settle your anger, then you're imprisoned by your anger. It imprisons you. So Jesus fulfills the law, but the issue isn't usually murder. The heart issue is anger says, come on, let's not, yeah, 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 we get it, you're not going to kill anybody, but let's find out what the heart is behind that, because we can murder people with our words. Here's, then he goes on as another example, he says, don't commit adultery and don't divorce. Now, that one might hit a little closer to home, because uh, our culture has, uh, you know, divorce and adultery happens a lot in our culture. And we might say, I haven't murdered anybody, but there's a lot of divorced people around. But thankfully, there's grace. Now, this, this one in particular is a pro-woman stance that Jesus is giving here. He's talking to men in particular because men have power in this situation. They were the only ones that had power to divorce. They were the, the ones that were, were in power for adultery. And people were following the letter of the law. We can get into all the history stuff, but it's, that's actually boring. They were doing everything up to, uh, up to adultery, not quite crossing the line. 
And they, then they were giving their wives uh, written certificates of divorce. They were following the letter of the law exactly as it was intended. But we would call those loopholes today. It's a loophole to, to understand how that uh, 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 divorce certificate thing worked. And uh, loopholes keep you legal, but it's just kind of skating by on the edge of that. Recently, there was um, uh, an article came out. I think the New York Times released President Trump's tax returns. Remember that? Just a, there's been so much news cycle since then, but but that was out there. And and besides it being a well-timed political ploy by a left-leaning newspaper, you know, during an election season, they knew what they were doing, by the way. But they say he took advantage of what loopholes, loopholes to not pay a whole bunch of taxes. Essentially, that's it, right? Uh, bad news for those who are trying to get him, that's not a loophole. That's called law. He, he followed the law. The, the problem is, uh, what people don't like about that, is that it skirts the intent, the heart behind the law, that we would all pay our fair share in taxes with everybody else. That's the part that gets everybody bent out of shape. It didn't follow the intent or the heart behind the law. There was loopholes. And so Jesus uh, it gets to the point of this law behind all of this. Yeah, you're following the letter of the law, but there's all these loopholes there. He says, let's get behind that. Um, and this is one of the only times that Jesus talks about human sexuality. He takes it to the heart behind there, and he calls it lust. Lust. He's like, man, let's stop it at lust, and then adultery doesn't happen. Because if you have lust in your heart, you've already done the deed anyway. We use, we, we use this verse a lot back in my youth ministry days, you know, with those lusty teenage boys, you know, like, hey guys, let, let's calm it down here. And Jesus uses hyperbole to make his point, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand. Now, he wasn't serious about that, thankfully, or, or there'd be a lot of people with no eyes and no hands, you know. W women, it works for you too. But again, he's talking specifically to men because of their position of power. So Jesus turns this idea of, of you're skating by on all these things that happen, uh, all these laws that you are technically following, turns this upside down. He says, you heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I'm telling you to stop way before that. Stop long before it comes to that, at the point of lust. And folks, for us these days, with the internet and all the different things, that means pornography, steamy books, Movies, magazines, thoughts, side hugs, a windy day, whatever it is that makes lust awaken in you, that's where it needs to stop. And it doesn't matter if you're hetero, homo, cis, a, whatever you are, however you identify, the principle applies to you just the same as it applies to me, all of us the same. He says, knock it off at lust. Do you see how this is a new politic? This is a new way of interacting with p people, with humanity. And it's not just about heterosexuality or adultery. Jesus goes way beyond that and introduces us to the heart behind the law. If you can get to the heart of the law, then the letter of the law is followed naturally. Jesus says he fulfills the law. Then he gives us another example. He says, well, for example, taking oaths. I'll read that one again. Again, you've heard it said of the days of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is in the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your hand, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Oh, excuse me, don't take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you, simply, what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. I think uh, Jesus is, is basically jumping on, on this kind of, kind of like this. He's like, people are making commitments based on things they have absolutely no control over. Heaven, earth, Jerusalem, your own life. And people today say, I swear on my mother's life, or something like that, right? Like, whoa, why, why you got to bring your mom in on that? Like, she didn't do anything. Are you gonna, how are you going to control that one? Or people say, I swear to God, or I swear on the Bible. 
We've got no control over those things. Why would you swear on them? You can't cash that in. You can't turn them in for the thing you're swearing on. It just doesn't work. God is in control of every one of those single things, and God created all the things that Jesus is listing. So by virtue of the fact that God created those things, he's the one that's in control of them. So Jesus is just saying, look, build a character of trust and integrity, and then your yes will be a yes, and your no will be a no. It's just a simple trust issue. The character of your life should be such that you are trusted, and you don't have, you don't have to swear on anything. I said, yes, I'd do it. I'm going to do it. Nope, I'm not, I'm not doing it. And guess what? I'm not going to. <laughs> you don't have to swear on anything. And Jesus is calling us, uh, excuse me, Jesus isn't calling us to call out other people's integrity on this. He's calling out our own. We're the ones who have control over our own integrity. Now, uh, I'm going to save that next piece the turn the other cheek part for next week. But I want to wrap this up in maybe a little different way, and I want to see if we can tie a couple things together. Go back in your heads all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, God's busy every day creating something new, right? Every day there's something new. At the end of each day, what does he call it? Good. Yeah, as the angels, he called it good. And then at the end of the week, what did he call the whole of creation? Very good. It's good, good. Everything was good. God is the one who has the authority to call things good. Then Adam and Eve come on the scene, right? Genesis chapter 3, they have one law to follow. What's that one we've gone over the last couple of weeks? Don't eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and knowledge of what? good and evil. Don't eat that fruit of that tree. But then, tempter comes along, Eve sees it, and you might not remember the full story, but what does she say about that tree? She says that tree looks what? Good. It looks good to eat. It looks good to the eye. And she says, it looks good for wisdom. And so what we see from the very beginning is the temptation for humanity to redefine what God has said was good. We want to make good in our own terms. This has been the problem from generation to generation to generation, all the way up to now. We we call that first one original sin, but, but really it's our human predilection to redefine for ourselves what is good. God set up the Hebrew structure with ten laws, each with their own intent and purpose. And the Jewish leaders increased that ten to 613. And Jesus said he came to fulfill all of those. But even with those laws, humans started redefining what was good in their own eyes. I don't have to murder anybody. But it seems good for me right now to just completely destroy people who I disagree with politically on Facebook. That seems good. It's a constant temptation for people, isn't it? I don't I try not to do that. Like (laughs) I'm not saying me, I'm just saying humanity in general. Okay? We 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 seem to think it's okay, it's good to do that. Let me take that person down a notch. It seems good to humans to allow anger to drive them to do all sorts of evil things to other humans. We see it all the time today because even Christians don't take Jesus seriously on this. And social media is a platform that just makes it so much easier to perform those dastardly deeds. I think this redefining of what good is 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 the problem that's at the heart of the problem behind the, the hypersexualization of our culture. Is it just because that I'm getting older, it seems like there's more skin on screens these days? It's like, man, everywhere you look, there's skin on screen. Maybe I'm just getting old. Or maybe there's just more screens. I don't know. It's because it seems good to humans to promote things through exploiting the human body but we're created in the image of God, and here we go 
exploiting one another. And so perhaps most may not commit adultery, but Jesus says it's not good to lust. And we have redefined for ourselves what seems good to us. Think about the story of, of David. Well, one of the stories. David and Bathsheba. It's exactly where it started. She was out on her roof bathing, right? Wearing the clothes that you wear when you bathe. And it looked what? Good to David. And so lust started in his heart and then end up people dying from that sin. We're constantly redefining what is good. And I think the biggest problem with the hypersexualization of our culture isn't necessarily that there's more skin on screens, but rather that we haven't equipped ourselves to be able to handle it. We're unable to handle it. And the more I talk to people, the more I realize that these kinds of issues are issues that nobody talks about, and nobody prepares people for these things. And so we don't have healthy ways to be mature in these areas, especially as Christians, and to help one another with them. And so some people revert to the proverbial cutting out, uh, uh, out the eye and cutting off the hand because that seems good to them, or at least better than dealing with the temptation of lust. Here's the last one we're going to deal with today. Jesus says he comes to fulfill the law. For example, how about making oaths? It seems good to humans to swear on something that we have no control over, and we can't cash it in on even if we wanted to, which we don't have any intention of doing anyway. <laughs> I swear to my mom's life. Yeah, whatever. What, what, what good does that do? No intention of doing anything about it. Why doesn't, it, why doesn't it seem too good to us just to have integrity? Just let our yes be yes and our no mean no. Why does it seem good for us to find loopholes in the law that exploit people? Jesus is pleading with us, be different than everybody else. Be different than your neighbors around us. Most of them actually follow the laws too. They're not out there murdering, committing adultery. They, but they are out there acting on their anger and their lust. And so are we, Christians. We've got to stop it. We must quit redefining what is good and start letting Jesus define what is good for us. Sometimes in order to find and live in what God says is good for us, we might have to give something up. We might have to make a sacrifice. Jesus says, cut off your hand, pluck out your eye. But he wasn't talking literally. He meant cut out the things that you think are good, but God says, that's not good. He isn't meaning even to necessarily cut out temptations, but prune from your life the things that you falsely think are good, but are rather making you just like your neighbors around you in the world. They're, making you, they're keeping you from being holy like Jesus. And so these three things, and the two we're going to talk about next week, are social principles of Jesus, and they're not limited to these things. These were, are just examples that Jesus provides in his sermon. These are ways that we encounter others with Jesus in mind, being defined by what God says is good, and not looking for loopholes to exploit our fellow human beings. So I ask you, in our hyper-sexualized climate that we live in, how would not exploiting your fellow humans make an impact on you and those around you? In our, our politically charged climate, how does this look in your world where we can apply the principles of Jesus about anger and not destroying one another with our words? How much easier would life be if people just trusted you every time you said something? They knew that you would come through with what you said you would do. It takes time to build up that kind of trust. That's a whole other sermon. But how would that be different in your world? Because in Jesus' politic, his way of interacting with the world, he turns everything upside down. 
And if we were to live this out in the real world, it could turn our world upside down too. Next week we're going to talk about those principles that are even more scandalous. Turn the other cheek. Oh man, that's going to be a tough one. Turn the other cheek. These days? Turn the other cheek? I don't think so, Jesus. Listen to the words that Jesus might have for you today. How might you change your home, change your neighborhood, your school, or your work if you applied Jesus' social principles into your life? Let us pray.